Thanks everyone for joining today. Today's Bench to Market talk is called Protecting Your Innovation, Intellectual Property Basics and Strategy. And as a reminder, this whole talk series, Bench to Market, is co-sponsored by my organization, Biolocity, as well as the Georgia Tech Parker HPT Institute for Bioengineering and Biosciences and Georgia CTSA. Before we get started, I just want to remind everyone of a couple of resources available to our Georgia Tech and the Emory community. Um, Biolocity offers legal office hours with Emory School of Law professor Nicole Morris. You can sign up for a time on our website if you've got questions about intellectual property, um, and Professor Morris can, can help walk you through that. We also offer pro bono technology consultation office hours with our team, the Biolocity team, as well as our entrepreneurs and residents. Um, it, we're more well known for our, our funding opportunities, but even if you're not interested in funding in the in the near future, you're always welcome to sign up for an hour to bounce ideas off of us and just sort of chat about your technology and how it could fit into a commercial opportunity. Um, so please reach out if you're interested in this opportunity. Uh, we're always happy to, to meet with teams throughout the year. Some of you may know that Biolocity is part of the BARDA Drive Accelerator Network, so this allows us to have access to some national resources for funding as well. BARDA publishes areas of interest they are interested in funding, usually related to health security. Um, we try to keep our website up to date with this. You can also check out BARDA's website, but if you think that your technology might be a fit for one of these uh, areas of interest, feel free to reach out to us and we can connect you to the right folks at BARDA. And as a reminder, Biolocity also offers a shared lab space incubator program called Lab to Launch. This is currently an Emory specific program for Emory spin out companies. Um, we've just welcomed, I think, nine companies into our space um, and we'll have a kind of rolling application process. So if you're interested in lab space for your newly founded startup, uh, please feel free to contact Harry Gerard um, at lab to launch at emory.edu. And our next Bench to Market talk is going to be January 17th. This is a hybrid event, so there will be an in-person option at the Sudeth Room at IBB, as well as a virtual option as well. Um, you can go ahead and sign up for this one on our website. This is going to be all about investment in dilution um, with James Stubbs. Um, this is usually a really popular talk. Uh, Dr. Stubbs is a, a serial entrepreneur himself, so he can tell you all about his experience in the trenches of entrepreneurship and how investment in dilution works out with various financing rounds. So it should be a great talk. But without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists for today. I'm really excited about the conversation today. Um, our first panelist is uh, my old friend and colleague, Sarah Wilkening, uh, who's a patent associate at Merchant and Gould, as well as her colleague um, and partner, Dan Evans, um, who is a partner at Merchant and Gould. Um, after their presentation, we'll also be having a question and answer session with uh, the tech transfer leaders, Mary Albertson at Georgia Tech um, or GTRC OTL, as well as Todd Shear at Emory OTT. Um, so I'm very excited about this. As a reminder, we do have a Q&A button at the bottom. So if you have questions during the talk, please feel free to send them in um, and we'll add that to the discussion for our Q&A. So I will turn it over to, to Sarah and Dan. Thanks, John. All right, let me work on getting this slideshow up and then someone give me a thumbs up when I get it. Actually, no thumbs up because I can't see anything anyways. It looks great. Okay, perfect. <laughs> well, thank you, John, again for inviting me to come back and talk. It's always a, a great pleasure of mine to talk with um, Biolocity and these bench to market um, presentations. Um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dan Evans. Uh, we're going to talk about protecting your innovations. Um, we kind of start over with an IP 101 um, with a heavy focus on patents and if they're necessary for your inventions. And then we go through a, an example invention that I have come up with to walk through what we do when we come up with, we have new inventions uh, presented to us. Um, so with that, here's our typical disclaimer that this is for educational purposes and especially patents are gonna be fact dependent in a case by case basis. So uh, you will need to contact an attorney to work through such issues. Um, and this presentation is not make, making any attorney client privilege or any other relationship, but this is just mine and Dan's opinion. So uh, our first question is, oh, we're stuck. <laughs> Why do we care about intellectual property? In general, the broad uh, idea is that intellectual property can protect your investments, what you're doing in the research, or if you're coming up with a startup concept, 
and intellectual property can be various different ways to help protect that. I can also prevent competitors in some instances from stealing your ideas. And especially with startup companies, it can help lead to investment and um, you know get some customers because it provides some legitimacy to your company. Um, but the basic types of intellectual property, I'm sure everyone's heard of these before, uh, but the four general types are copyrights, trademarks, trade secrets, and patents. And just a, a quick example of each. So copyright will protect the original works of authorship when it's put into some sort of tangible form of expression. So you can think of like music or books as a, an example of copyrights. Uh, trademarks, I like to think of branding. So you see this uh, Starbucks coffee sign, you think instantly of the coffee and the goods and services that Starbucks provides. For trade secrets are a very common example of Coca-Cola here in Atlanta. Um, it provides, it protects all types of information, um, however it is stored or maintained, provided that measures are taken to maintain its secrecy. So for Coca-Cola, we have the formula in a vault somewhere. <laughs> and then lastly, patents, which we'll spend the majority of our talk going over to keep with the circular theme of this image. Here's an example of a design patent for the Model 3 wheels of the Tesla. Um, but we're going to get into a little bit of more specifics on patents versus utility patents versus design patents. But let's get into more detail. Dan, why should we care about patents? Oh, well, wow. <laughs> why do we care about patents? Uh, as you said, it helps uh, you to protect your ideas. But then the question is, well, uh, what can you do with that? Uh, it's really, it allows you to exclude others from doing what? Making, using, selling, importing into the United States, your patented invention. And in essence, uh, you know, for a patent, you get a limited monopoly uh, of your rights to exclude others. And that's uh, 15 years for a design patent and uh, 20 years uh, from the filing date uh, for your utility patent, uh, at least um, uh, 20 years from the first filing effective date. So. Uh, you know, it, it provides you with an option because if you have a small business and you have invested capital in that small business, if you do not have a patent that protects your IP, you may be sunk, right? So it's kind of one of the quivers in the arrow, so to speak, uh, arrows in the quiver that allows you to uh, advance your business um, plan. That's right. And some misconceptions that a lot of people have on patents is it doesn't give you the right. So when we talk about excluding, we are preventing others from doing things that you have filed in your patents. Just because you get a patent on something doesn't mean you have the right to do it. So we'll kind of talk about that, especially when we go through an example invention towards the end of the talk. Um, but what do, what do patents do? So it does not grant the affirmative right, like I just mentioned. It, it, might, it prevents others from making, selling, or using your invention. And there are three types of patents. You have a utility patent that's the most common that you'll see where you can cover a process, a manufacture, a composition of matter, or methods of doing those. Uh, design patents are going to be specifically around the actual ornamental design of the, of the invention. Like, for example, the wheel for Tesla. It was very specific to how it was designed ornamentally. And then lastly, we have plant, plant patents um, that can be any variety of plant that has been asexually reproduced. Um, so maybe the crux of this conversation, do you need a patent? Um, that, that depends, maybe or maybe not. It, sometimes it also depends on who you're talking to. Um, I like to think that as a patent attorney, I'm not going to tell you every single person needs a patent. Um, but there are some things that you need to consider. Dan, do you have any ideas of um, what you could consider for if you need to have a patent? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> I have lots of ideas, Sarah. Uh, but mainly the question is that I ask, do you have the money? Because patents aren't cheap. And two, yep. uh, is there a product or a market associated with the product or the idea that you've developed? Um, without a marketed product, um, Really, a patent is meaningless, and I, I kind of convey the story of a, a gentleman uh, that lives out in the Athens area, uh, a gentleman named Robert Stribling, uh, who developed what's known as the last straw. Um, he, he was uh, real big in waste management in the Athens area, and uh, he saw that his young children were spilling juice 
uh, from the juicy boxes all over it. And so he said, okay, I'll make a straw. And it, the straw that can be inserted in the juice box has a check valve. So that when the child actively sucks on the straw, uh, it delivers product. But uh, when there is no active, uh, you know, sucking on the straw, nothing comes out, no mess. And so therefore you're gonna have a happy parent, right? Uh, well, the issue with that is uh, he got some patents, uh, clever idea. He had a wealth of money to support his idea because he was again uh, involved in waste management, uh, went nationally. Uh, I mean, he went to the Today Show, he was on Fox and Friends, and he was trying to drum up business for his product, which was clever product. The issue was is that the manufacturers of the juice boxes were not interested in, in incorporating that straw into their juice box products because of the profit margin. Because he wasn't able to persuade these companies to incorporate his product into their products, it was all for naught. So um, big picture is, is one, really, do you need it? And two, is there a market? And, and if there is a market or a potential market, what's your plan for that? Because if you don't have a plan, a business plan associated with that, really a patent is just, you know, it's a, it's a window prize. Um, so Sarah, you, you've got other considerations that I think you've identified on the slide, but that's kind of my initial take on uh, whether you need a patent or not. That's right. Especially if you're a startup company, you're definitely going to be considering the value and return on investment for getting an expensive patent to allowance and to issuance in U.S. or other jurisdictions. Um, I think a lot of these points that are listed here, so patentability, freedom to operate, we'll go into that in our example invention. But these are also points to that the tech transfer professionals, if you're in the university setting, these are things that they think about as they're making their decisions too. And so this helps you kind of put put that yourselves in their perspective when you're coming up with your ideas um, that might be helpful for you and for them ultimately. So let's quickly go over some of the requirements for an invention to be patentable. I like to think of this as uh, the whole patent as a, as a whole is your, is your completed puzzle. And then each of these pieces will help determine or help make this patent uh, patentable, this invention patentable. Um, so for example, we have patentable subject matter. Um, this is going to be anything that's a useful, this is how the statute is, defines it, a useful process, machine, manufacture, composition of matter. And this can also include methods of making, methods of using, and any improvements that, of a prior invention. Um, so this is something that um, we'll, we'll have people kind of talk about this as the 101 of patentability. Um, but this is... Um, definitely one of the first steps when you see an invention, if, if it's necessary or if it's useful to get a patent on it. There are certain kind of categories that the courts have determined are not patentable. So laws of nature, physical phenomenon, and abstract ideas are statutorily not patentable. The next in the puzzle piece is written description. So this is Disclosure is essential in your patents. It's a quid pro quo. So you get the, the years of exclusivity for the ex, of the trade of you giving a full disclosure of your invention, which is a full, clear, and concise uh, and exact terms of the invention to enable another to create the same invention without undue experimentation. And so novelty and non-obviousness we're about to get into, novelty is questioning if your invention is known publicly. So that means, is it out there in any other form, such as a patent or publication? Have you already, have already presented it in a poster presentation at a conference? Have you already offered it for sale? Have you used it publicly? So these are questions that you will be looking into for your own personal invention, but also what the patent office is looking into when they're looking at granting a patent application. They're going to look through all these different sources that are available in the public and seeing if um, your invention is known already. And then maybe the Achilles heel of getting patents is the non-obviousness uh, requirement. Um, so this is if your claimed invention is known and or suggested in the public. 
So this can be any combination of those uh, references and sources that I mentioned in the prior slide. So any types of publications, articles, dissertations, things of that nature. So the examiner will look at if the claimed invention is different from what is known or suggested at the time that the invention is made. And this is where a lot of patent attorneys spend a lot of their times arguing against the patent office and trying to negotiate getting some claims to allowance on non-obviousness. So that was a really quick overview, but before we go into my new invention that I've created, I think it's helpful to take a look at the anatomy of a patent um, and understand where we look to for certain legal questions that may arise when you evaluate your new ideas. So this is an image here of a cover page for both a utility application, which is the one in the back, and a design application. And I'll point to some of the distinctions there in a second. Um, the specification is going to be the majority of the application. This is more of the description and explaining the best mode. This is what satisfies that written description puzzle piece that fully enables someone to recreate your invention. A lot of times there will be drawings. In a utility, they're not necessary. But in a design patent, they're mandatory, as you need to show all the ornamental angles of a design in that design patent. And then towards the end, you're going to have the claims, which we'd like to describe as the meat of the invention. The claims are what define what your invention is. And finally, an abstract similar to what you would have in, a, in an article or a publication. So here's the distinction between utility, where we have a US patent number 9815719. Uh, this one is, um, you can tell the difference between this utility patent and a design patent, because first of all, the design patent says United States design patent, but then it also has a D in front of the uh, number of the patent. All right, Dan, now I'm gonna to come to you with my invention. I'm going to okay. come as a non-patent professional, and I'm going to come and ask you if I should get a, a, a patent over this invention that I've created. I'm in the phase of my life where a lot of my friends are having babies, and so I think it'd be great to have a smart baby. Everyone wants a smart baby, and I wanted to create a new non-invasive headband that will use neurostimulation and enhance the quality of sleep for my baby, but also analyze the brain waves and provide gentle pulses to improve sleeping. And then finally, I want to make sure it passively teaches my baby to be smart by teaching it math, science, maybe foreign languages. And then, you know, if it's my baby, I want it to know the law too, because I think that'd be really interesting. So something that kind of looks like um, this cute ornamental headband, but kind of make it, you know, more science-y, like, like in this picture here. Okay, great. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just go through my my initial spill. Well, do you really need it? Um, and, and one, of course, is there a market? And understand, of course, that getting patents, um, it's not cheap. Um, but then I would I would say uh, give you a classical lawyer example. Well, it depends. Depends, um, right? <laughs> right? Uh, and and I, you know, think about it in the sense when I when I go to social events, I oftentimes do not tell people that. I'm a patent attorney, but inevitably when someone asks, and I do reveal that, I can guarantee you that each person in identifies says, I hey, idea. I had an idea, I had an idea, and every single person and every one of us have ideas. And because of those ideas, they evoke passions and excitement. You say, I've got a great idea. And then <laughs> what do you think? I'm gonna make money, right? And so there's a passion and then there's objectivity. And so I say, okay, well, look, let's separate the passion from the objectivity and say, do you really need it, right? But related to Sarah's question, can I get a patent? It's like, well, it depends, but my recommendation would be to conduct a prior art search. You know, um, and as Sarah pointed out here, uh, you know, there's really no legal requirement to do so, but you are making an investment on your idea. And really when you're drafting patent applications, you have to have an understanding of what's gone on in the past. What is the famous uh, Isaac Newton uh, quote? Um, you know, I, I can see further because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. So that expression has 
particular meaning in the world of patenting because you are developing something. And if you do so and develop that and draft something in a vacuum, sometimes you do not have options when you are looking to patent what it is you actually claim. So yeah, a patentability search, uh, there's no legal requirement to do so, but it's a wise business investment to do so. And oftentimes for uh, starting uh, inventors and the like, you can do it yourself, right? right. Um, this is something that, you know, you have an intimate understanding of the technology. And so you have a, the best idea uh, of being able to figure out what's out there. So um, that said, um, I would say it's optional, but it's recommended, at least in my world. Okay. Well, let's talk about how we do patentability searches. So there's multiple ways that you can do this. Um, you can, you know, go out into the, the marketplace and see if anyone has this already on the sale. Um, easy way to do that is get on your computer and use your good friend Google. Um, there are plenty of uh, free databases that allow you to search for patents, publications, dissertations, and the like. Um, some free databases are listed here with the asterisk for SciFinder is a pretty expensive license or subscription. But most universities, if you're a university personnel, will have access to this. And I particularly like using SciFinder for small molecule searches. It's really easy to take your chem draw figure and add it into SciFinder and do a search for that. SciFinder is also useful for any other type of keyword searching. Um, you can do patent search companies. Um, there are a handful out that provide really good uh, reviews and good analyses with those. Uh, you can use a law firm. Um, if you're going to do your own, you can kick it up a notch, as I like to think about it, and add in some um, Boolean search syntaxes and wild cards, maybe some proximity operators. Uh, searching in particular parts of a patent, in particular like the title or the claims, I find to be very useful. A lot of times um, finding previous inventors that have done something already in the past and just built on their research and maybe developed something new, that's also another great way to start your search. I did a patentability search for my baby uh, NeuroWave sleep enhancer. Um, and here's my search query um, that was pretty generic. There's no uh, Boolean syntax here or any type of proximity. And there's uh, way too many results for me to search through. Um, and so by updating my search query, I'm able to, in this case, actually add more results because I added more terms that weren't particularly useful to finding and narrowing down my search. Um, but then after doing some additional Boolean uh, syntax and maybe adding in some um, quotations to make it very particular what I'm looking for in the patent, I got down to a reasonable number of 32 patents. And again, mind you, these are just from Google patent searching. I'll find a whole new set of references if I just did literature review or a SciFinder review. And lastly, I did a search that was focused on what the claims are covering in these patents that are coming up on Google, um, specifically for passive and training. Um, that one only came up with three results, which I felt like after I reviewed them weren't necessarily uh, helpful for my patentability review. So I focused on some of the results that came up in the, the 32 bunch. And I found this patent. Dan, I come to you and I bring you this patent and I say, hey, look, I found this patent. It looks like it, it is directed to some sort of headband. And here's some of the stuff I found by reading the specification, not necessarily the claims, but they do talk about having a monitor. This one looks like it's specific for a person's food consumption, which I don't really care about. Well, I mean, I should care about in a baby, but in my instance, I want my, my headband to teach it things and to help it sleep. Um, they do mention a headband, but is this something that I need to be concerned about? I mean, this is something that we would look deeper and maybe look at multiple examples to see. Maybe one reference discloses everything. So that would be more of a novelty issue because it's all combined in the public. Or maybe there's multiple references that someone could say, yeah, I just read these three things and I came up with my invention. And now all three of these are suggested in the public. So that would be an, an obvious issue. But there's some other things to consider. Uh, Dan, reading this though, just this patent, I don't think it covers what I want to do. So now that we've, in my opinion, cleared the patentability search, what are some things that you would also tell me to, to be focused on? 
Yeah, well, I, I think that's a, that's actually a good find. And, you know, it, it, if you can just take a little bit of time and take a peek at the patent literature, keeping in mind that, you know, there's a, a whole wealth of other information that you may not have considered, but having this information in mind arms you with options as you start thinking about drafting your applications. But uh, related to um, what Sarah is pointing out here, think about, okay, I had this great idea. And did you turn around and did you tell somebody? Um, <laughs> all and, my friends. Uh, all you my told friends. all your friends. Uh-oh, that that triggers a prior art event, right? Okay. Um, you know, uh, it, <laughs> some people that might not be scrupulous would say, well, they'll never, ever spill the beans on me, right? And so that's <laughs> not really a disclosure. We don't recommend that, especially if you're devoting thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars into this um, project. So um, before you disclose it to anyone, keep keep it mum. If you do decide to disclose it to anyone, consider a confidentiality agreement, uh, preferably in writing, not just a handshake or a, a verbal agreement. And then before you get something, before you discuss it, as Sarah has pointed out here, consider filing what's known as a provisional patent application. Uh, and what that does is it allows you the opportunity to, uh, I wouldn't say freely discuss your invention, but it allows you to discuss your invention with others, at least what's disclosed in the claim of uh, the disclosure of the provisional patent application. Yeah. And some key points for why this is important is there is that public disclosure bar that Dan mentioned, or use bar, or even a sale bar. In the US, you do get a one-year grace period from the date that you have disclosed it. So for example, if I had gone to a conference and gave a talk on this uh, baby neuro wave uh, enhancer, uh, I would have a one-year grace period in order to get my patent application on file before the patent office would say, no, you've already disclosed this. You're outside of your one-year grace period. This doesn't relate necessarily to all jurisdictions, however. So, for example, Europe and Japan, they don't allow grace periods. And so you might lose your rights in certain countries if I wanted to go international with this. So for Europe and Japan, you would definitely need to have something on file before being having disclosed or shared this information with others. The U.S. kind of gives you a little bit of grace period, but this is going to be a big hit. So I know I want to go international with it, obviously. So practical tips for that would be to keep your invention close to your chest and um, use confidentiality agreements so you don't avoid losing rights in those jurisdictions that don't allow any grace periods. Or you can file a patent application. And again, still being mindful of what you've disclosed in the application because whatever you don't disclose is not necessarily protected. And after you have a patent application filed, you are allowed to market it as patent pending. However, that has no legal uh, uh, legal effect. You won't be able to sue someone just because you have a, a patent pending, um, but it can put someone on notice that you have this invention that you are, are seeking protection for. And it could also be used as a, a helpful marketing tool. Hey, look, right. I need your money. Uh, by the way, I got a patent pending. So excellent <laughs> point, Sarah. Yes, absolutely. Um, one question that comes up pretty frequently um, when we evaluate new inventions is who is going to be the proper inventor that should be listed on any patent application? So inventorship is a legal definition, and it's going to be the person who conceives of the idea. and provided that conception is completed or is reduced to practice. So I like to give the example from my grad school days, I was the expert in doing electron microscopy. And so people would come to me from my lab and other labs and give me their samples to get the perfect images for. And so I would conduct the images, I'd bring it back to them. And a lot of times those images would be published. And so as someone that just did the work I would become a co-author maybe on their publication, but I didn't conceive or help complete the invention and put it into uh, what is called re reduced to practice. It may have already been done. I just helped them on the step to completing it, but I didn't actually do any of that additional work to become an inventor. Um, so this is a quick comparison of inventorship and co-authorship. Inventorship is going to be a patent law question, whereas co-authorship is going to be more copyright. 
Um, but inventor is another point is this is based on the claims of the patent. So remember the anatomy of the patent. It doesn't matter that if my electron microscopy images and the support for that show up in the specification, that's not going to help that invention become patentable based on the claims of the patent. So I would still not be considered an inventor then. Um, I don't think, am I missing anything, Dan, on inventorship and co-authorship? Uh, no, but I can tell you, I would like to add that it's a hard pill to swallow for yeah. some scientific investigators who have contributed, at least in their mind, of not being an inventor. Yes. Um, case in point, I uh, was working with a company many years ago to develop a hepatitis C drug. And um, the chemists oftentimes were named as the inventors, while the biologists were left to run assays. And I was given the unenviable, unenviable task by management uh, to tell the biologists that they did not qualify as inventors on the patent application that included their assay results showing that the small you know, chemical entity was capable of effectively inhibiting, um, uh, you know, hepatitis C um, enz enzymatic machinery in vitro, as well as in vivo results. So just keep in mind, inventorship is not the same as co-authorship, or in the case of Sarah's, um, micro, uh, you know, your, your electron microscopy you. example, acknowledgement. So just keep that in mind and just be aware that you may not be uh, while you may have contributed, you may not be an inventor. And that that's really a hard decision. And uh, I think the next slide relates to ownership that's right. because that's, that's kind of a critical piece that we have to understand. Um, ownership, the inventors, at least initially, are the owners for the patent at, at question, right? But if you develop that invention, while you are obliged to assign your rights to your employer, for example, then that may be a problem, uh, especially if you're thinking about doing a startup company. Had a nice, lovely discussion with uh, uh, you know, an Ivy League um, doctor this past week. And one of the questions that she asked me was like, can I be excluded as a named inventor on the patent application? I said, no. She, I said, why would you be concerned about? Well, I don't know whether or not what I have done related to my startup company falls within the scope of my employment agreement. So that's something that you actually, you need to understand and query that individual at the time where you're discussing all of these things. Yes. So, because ownership is the name of the game. Who owns the patent is capable of suing and excluding others. If you don't have ownership, uh, you can't, you don't have the right to exclude others to use your invention. So- that, that's kind of a, my, my take on it, Sarah. Yeah, and absolutely. I think each university will evaluate that in their own perspective. They all have their own IP policies. I've been in situations where a university does not want to assert ownership as they deemed it outside the scope of their employment. Uh, and so the inventor was able to take ownership of that patent application on their own. But it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, and it's something that needs to be brought up initially. It's a lot harder to put everything back in order after patents have been filed. It's not impossible. It just makes it more difficult and <laughs> a little bit more paperwork and attorney time that, that you would want to avoid in, in an ideal case. Um, so Dan, I decided that maybe I do want to go ahead and file a patent application on this uh, NeuroWave Sleep Enhancer. Do you have any suggestions that I could um, maybe avoid risk of getting infr an infringement, a cease and desist letter from somebody? Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, granted, uh, uh, a patentability opinion or assessment is not necessary. It's optional. But have an understanding of uh, what's known prior to the giant, so to speak, um, is a big deal, especially if you start developing your product and you get a cease and desist letter that says, hey, you're infringing our patent. And yeah. you say, huh? Well, how does that happen? And you think about all of the money that you spend and all the folks within your personal and professional network where you've asked for money. And then they come to you and say, wait, you can't market your product because you don't have the freedom. And by the way, the money that you promised me, I've got to give part of that to this, you know, 
company whose patent you're infringing? Oh, no. So this is very important for the big picture. And it's the big picture that you need to investigate as a part of your uh, business plan, if you will. So Sarah has identified the patent landscape, um, you know, as a part of that patentability search, you can develop an understanding of the patent landscape. And then often the question becomes as well, are you free to operate? And which requires looking at the claims of yep. the patents that you've identified. In the example that Sarah provided, that was a US patent. Um, yes. are, are you going outside the US? Are you an ex US jurisdiction in Canada, Mexico? We're a global uh, economy. And so you're thinking not just selling in the United States, you're at least thinking about selling in the NAFTA jurisdictions as well as other WTO jurisdictions. And so as a part of that landscape, you need to be mindful of the other jurisdictions where there may be associated patent rights. So you have to understand what those patent claims are and where you actually are marketing that product. Let's revisit the patent that I found earlier from my patentability search. I, I think if I read through these claims, if I understand it correctly, and if I understand my own invention, then I haven't created yet. Uh, some of these that I've highlighted in green sound exactly like what I'm going to be doing. A mobile wearable electromagnetic brain activity monitor fits on someone's head. I don't have a frame or a pair of glasses. I don't think that's necessary for a baby. They probably would just be really irritated with that. Um, I don't quite understand the full phase sinusoidal variations. So that would be something I would have to understand further. I will have electromagnetic energy sensors. And then this yellow, I haven't even considered yet because uh, I'm still in the process of deciding if I want to patent this. Um, but based on, the, based on my review of these claims, maybe, it, maybe it's not such a smart idea. I don't know, Dan, is this something that's worth going forward with? Well, so I should invest uh, my time. <laughs> once again, I would say it depends, right? It depends. And, and separating the passion the passionate uh, responses versus the objective responses. And so um, oftentimes you, you know, there, there are folks that I've spoken to that says, I'm gonna do it regardless. And I thought, <laughs> okay, then pay me or do it yourself, right? I mean, or get somebody else. There are, there are other people, there are patent agents around that are, that are doing this type of work. So, uh, you know, in, in this particular example, should you do it? I would say, well, Sarah, what's the market? What do you plan on doing with it? Do you see a potential? I'll be still my friends. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'll be still my friends. That's a pretty small market right now. <laughs> but thank you, Dan. I appreciate you know, giving me some things to think about for my invention. I did not have everyone sign a non-disclosure agreement for this meeting. So I think that uh, this would be considered a public disclosure. Um, especially because it's recorded. Um, but that is uh, the conclusion of my invention. And it we we'll turn it over to questions and discussions. And um, hopefully we didn't um, cause any more confusion on patentability and protecting your innovation. Thank you so much, Sarah and Dan. That was a great presentation. I always love the uh, the examples that you bring to these talks, especially <laughs> as, the, as the father of an eight-month-old. No. Um, so I think this was really great. As a reminder to our um, to our attendees, please feel free to add questions into the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom. Um, I will pick things off with a couple of questions that came in in advance, as well as some topics that um, that I'm curious about. You know, one of the big points that you brought up today was this whole concept of public disclosure and how that could influence your patentability moving forward. I think that academic innovators are at a difficult point in this because they're under a lot of pressure to publish and to you know spread their findings at conferences and in academic articles. Um, so I'd like to turn to our technology transfer experts, Mary and Todd, um, to maybe give some perspective or, or advice to academic innovators on how you can kind of balance those two pressures. You think your technology might have some commercialization potential, you think you want to patent it, but you know, you've also got this, this pressure to publish. So, so what would you suggest as a way to kind of manage that? Go ahead, Todd. I was going to let you jump in first, Mary. Um, we can talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, the, um, I guess the most obvious thing to say is, is that we would strongly urge you to talk to us as early as possible. Um, we have a technology scout uh, that we send out across campus, um, specifically with this in mind, to talk to researchers and teams of researchers uh, about what's going on in the lab um, and try to increase the odds that we'll learn about it early so that we have time to evaluate it in advance. 
um, of publication. Um, and even if you've published, not necessarily all is lost. So we would still um, like to talk to you uh, so that we can look into the details of that. Mary? I, I would agree. I mean, we're doing a lot of outreach and one of the number one things that we talk about is when do you disclose? And we have a slide that says before you make a public disclosure. And then it's like, well, really an enabling public disclosure. And people sometimes really start asking a lot of picky questions about that. And I just say, talk to us early. But you know, sometimes they get the inventors, the faculty get concerned. And I'm like, our job is not to get in the way of publication. If you want us to protect it, this is what you need to do. You know, you're not going to get in trouble. Um, and like Todd said, I mean, they come to us and they're, they've already published. We say, okay, is it worth to keep U.S. rights? But we do get people who come a week before they're going to publish or go give a presentation. Um, and we just have to file. Makes sense. Yeah, I think a recurring theme with these talks is to engage your tech transfer office early, be transparent because they're, they're here to help. Um, maybe dovetailing off of that, a lot of times, you know, when when people have an invention, it's tough to see what the eventual business model could be. You think that there could be some traction here. You think that it could be either a licensing opportunity to a known company, or maybe you want to start your own startup. But for a lot of technology, it could go in different directions. And, you know, the patent itself and the claim scope could kind of go in different directions. So, um, you know, I guess this could be for um, for any of our, our of our panelists. Maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, Sarah and Dan this one, but how do you advise clients on IP strategy at that really early stage to sort of leave doors open to the different routes that your your technology could take um, at when you're you know first disclosing or first thinking about a patent? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think a lot of it will depend on on who the individual is and how invested they are in this. Um, I think. For the example that that Dan gave earlier with the the last straw, I mean that person had all the intentions and good motivation. They just didn't have the cr the correct market. They didn't have what they needed to get the whole product all the way out there. But I think if a person were to come to me right now and say they have an invention, they don't have any ties to a university, I would recommend first doing their own patentability search like how we walked through to see what else is out there. And Dan, do you have any ideas on what else they could advise them to do before jumping into a patent? Oh yeah. Well, uh, my, my motto is always leave your options open. Right. Uh, and if you want to develop a product, even though it's a fluid uh, type of uh, market and you don't really know which way it goes, if you decide not to file a patent, you have foreclosed an option that may be available to you at some time later down the line. And all you can do, the best you can do is, well, I decide to file a patent application, describe what it is that you've invented, right? That what Sarah commented earlier, the, kind of the keystone of that is the description. And once you do that, then you can start adding and telling a narrative and Telling how the world that what how smart you are because you've invented this particular product. I I would say the perspective from the university side, you know, everything we have is early. Mm -hmm. um, I crack up when people companies send us stuff saying, "Oh, phase two clinical trials." I mean, Emory may have something different because given who Emory is, but um, so we have to make decisions all the time to file things that are early that we may not know what the market is, even what the product is. Um, and we trust our patent attorneys to make the patent as broad as possible. Um, and that's basically how we address that. We file provisionals on most of our um, disclosures, most of our submissions, and we don't have a crystal ball, we don't know. Um, and that's, I've been doing this for 30 years, and that's something that is always brought up in tech transfer. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to take off. So you have to, it's a numbers game in some cases. Yeah. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's, it, I, I appreciate the perspective from the university stage, especially considering kind of starting with a provisional and then updating and, you know, seeing if it makes sense to convert to a, to a full patent application. One of the questions that came in um, was, was related to this in a bit, um, sort of, you know, if you're looking for international coverage, um, I think you touched briefly on different jurisdictions, you can file a PCT, and then eventually there's a time to convert that PCT application or to nationalize it specific jurisdictions. What are some of the considerations that go in um, for, and maybe I'll, I'll direct this one at you, Todd, just because I know that this comes up in, in tech transfer often. Um, if you don't have a licensee immediately on the line, but you think this is a promising technology, how do you think about where to nationalize a PCT and, and and sort of you know considering the cost associated with that? Yeah, well, and of course the PCT is the easy stage, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can we can afford to be um, to be more optimistic at that stage, but I would say that the number one consideration we take into account is do we think we can get patentable subject matter? Um, and if the answer to that is yes, uh, and, and we actually don't even apply a super high bar to that, we don't have to be dead certain we're going to get an issued patent. We just have to be confident that uh, there's a reasonable chance we could. Um, and then beyond that, it sort of gets into, okay, um, have we set, how do, you, how do you success finding commercial interest? Um, if we haven't, um, what do we uh, what do we know uh, is going to happen with the technology next? Um, is the research team going to continue to work on it? Um, if they're not, it's even more important that we have a set of valuable patent claims that somebody else might want to license in as they currently exist. If it's a therapeutic, um, then there's more pressure on us to um, try to make sure that we have some kind of international protection um, because that's much more important for that type of a technology that we have some sort of worldwide or international rights in addition to US rights. If it's another technology type like a healthcare IT invention or a consumable or maybe a, a medical device, um, it might not be as important uh, and it might be easier to just pursue um, US protection. So, um, and then the other thing, of course, you can eventually get into if you feel optimistic enough about how your invention will, will be deployed and used within the healthcare um, uh, pathway, uh, you can start trying to get real clever about, okay, what countries um, have this disease most, uh, it, where it's going to be most prevalent. Um, but sometimes that's not the right answer either. Sometimes you have to look at the country to say, what kind of patent protection can I get within that country? Because some types of claims are allowable in some countries than others. And then in some countries, we have to ask ourselves, uh, okay, um, are intellectual property rights valued? Um, in those countries and will they be upheld? Um, so those are some of the many considerations uh, we take into account. The, the other thing I'll just quickly add is that we know from looking at our data at Emory that if you take all licensed technology that's either a therapeutic or a medical device and you say, how long did it take for us to find a licensed partner and execute a license uh, post-disclosure, it's five and a half years. Probably uh, perhaps a little bit shorter on average for medical devices, probably a little bit longer for therapeutics. So by definition, we know we're going to have to move into the international phases before we can expect, reasonably expect to have found uh, a business partner. And then it comes down to what's your patent budget and whether or not you can afford to file international. Um, absolutely. So a lot of considerations go into that decision. Um, like you said, there's the the market for the technology, the jurisdiction, and and how patent law is interpreted in those areas, um, and then even health economics. Uh, again, when you're considering how how different countries might 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 pay for a medicine or a, a device like this. Um, so I think that's really um, really helpful for a lot of innovators that are working in this space. Um, another question that I, I wanted to bring up is just maybe some examples of what I've been seeing um, of current current trends in research and, and commercialization. Um, we've been seeing a lot of stuff in artificial intelligence lately and AI. And I remember when I was first learning about IP, um, you know, many years ago, uh, there was sort of this this sense that software was just inherently much more difficult to patent, um, and especially artificial intelligence was sort of tricky. I'm I'm curious to see, um, you know, from, from Dan and Sarah's perspective, what are some of the current trends in, in IP protection of AI-based technology in biotech? Um, is there, you know, best practices or things to avoid, just things to consider when you're, when you're developing technology like this about what might be uh, protectable? 
Go ahead, Dan, I'll let you take a lead on this. Okay, sure. So, uh, you know, it, it, uh, that's what you said, John. Software technology uh, is inherently difficult because of the existing state of the law. Uh, we're helping a, a small company that's situated in Hungary. Um, what they did was is that they developed a an, an learning technology, if you will, artificial intelligence, uh, some, one might say, to help uh, evaluate the known drug substances um, you know, uh, and screening these libraries relative to what it does and what it's capable of binding to and idea or identify some active that may be used for this particular therapeutic. And so their business model is to assist pharmaceutical companies to be able to do that type of in silico type of work. And we've already obtained one patent for them. Uh, and we've got another continuing application on file. Uh, and we're looking to seek more, but it's not without its challenges, right? Um, but I, I want to add, you, you mentioned something about AI and tie that into what uh, Sarah said earlier related to inventorship. AI alone, it, well, can it be an inventor, right? And that's, you know, and, and that gets into the area of, well, who actually did the developing? Was it the artificial intelligence or was it the programmer? And so keeping in mind that AI is not an inventor. What was the, the name of the... Uh, Dabas, I think, was the name of the so-called inventor um, in the federal circuit said, you know, and there are other jurisdictions that are considering that issue now. And of course, they said, no, you got to be a person, right? Because uh, only people are inventors, at least because this is a right that's recognized under the Constitution and the Constitution flows from uh, the people of uh, the United States. So, um, Sarah, do you have anything else to add on that? I, I think... And my experience of, of preparing patent applications, there are a lot of uh, inventions that are adding AI as a component, um, but a lot of times it doesn't distinguish the invention and make it patentable per se. And so simply adding, we can use machine learning to do the same thing, isn't going to be the hook that gets you a patent, in my experience. It is going to be, an, it has been an uphill battle in getting patents directed towards using AI to do the things that have been done in the past. Yeah, that's really interesting, especially this inventorship of AI thing. Someday we're going to be paying royalties to computers, I guess. <laughs> um, you know, it reminds me, Sarah, of what you mentioned in your talk about obviousness, because I think, you know, some of the um, the AI situations that I'm familiar with is using, you know, a, a trained model, something that's a, an existing infrastructure, training it with some new data and getting some new outputs on it. Um, one of the questions that came in was, wanting to dig a little bit more into how non-obviousness is assessed by patent examiners. Um, so, you know, maybe you could just walk through an example. It doesn't have to be AI, but like what um, what are some examples of, of obviousness and how that's kind of prosecuted? Yeah, it's, it's a challenge. Um, examiners can find multiple references that exist in the public to combine and, and explain in their words that someone of of skill in the art that knows how to, to do this invention would have combined these references, maybe two, three, sometimes six, seven or more references that will take different elements from each of these references and say, look, it has the exact same thing that you're claiming that your invention does. And so the patent office will say, based on these combinations, that it would have been obvious to combine these. Um, there's a whole um, host of other factors that the patent examiners can use. Um, those are the, the, the wands, wands factors. You may have heard some attorneys say. Um, but Dan, maybe you have a, a more specific example. I know I'm working on one right now, but that's probably a little too. Um, oh, close. sure. Well, <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, to, to simplify it, the examiner is adding stuff together and say, look, I found all of the elements of what you're claiming. Uh, in these prior art, so-called prior art references. And so that's what's known as a prima facie showing. And then our jobs as patent uh, representatives is to say, no, you're wrong, right? You haven't established or you haven't considered this information that says that when you add this and this, it doesn't work. Or, uh, you know, when you have this amount of stuff, 
it it says it doesn't you know it's bad in which case we you know we look at these components that are present in these references because the examiners are required um, to look as the, at the prior as a whole and if they look at things might um well microscopically if you will you just imagine the examiner they're churning away in their little hamster wheel they only get so many hours to work on it and so they're just control f control f control f i found all these pieces together done office action it comes to us and we have to then delve through that information and find and provide a reasoned rationale for saying why the examiner has not created a prima facie showing of obviousness so it's looking at those differences and providing factual and sometimes legal reasons why the examiner is wrong. And that's what makes the job exciting. <laughs> sometimes tedious, but exciting. I was going to say that exciting might depend on who's doing the work, but I'm glad that you find it exciting. <laughs> that's great. Um, well, again, I, I don't see any additional questions in the Q&A. Um, I've got one more. I mean, I could talk to these guys all day, but please, if, if you if you feel like you've got any other questions, feel free to drop them in. We've got a couple more minutes. Um, not seeing that, I, I want to, another situation in addition to AI that I think comes up a lot, especially in academic research, um, with, you know, chemistry or biology is that say you found an interesting target, um, for a therapeutic and you did this maybe with like a genetic knockdown model or something like that, where you understand a lot of the mechanism, you think there could be good therapeutic potential if you were to develop a small molecule or an antibody or something like that. Um, but you don't have that in hand yet. You want to publish it because you want to share your results on the mechanism, but that could be giving away some of your secret sauce about what you eventually want to do. How would it, how, how should a researcher handle this situation? And I, I kind of want to hear from everyone about this because I'm interested how the tech transfer folks think about this too. Maybe I'll start with you, Todd, just picking a name out of a hat. <laughs> uh, sorry, somebody was popping their head in my door. Specifically, the question was, how would you go about patenting that if you don't have the yeah, well, and also just, you know, like it, it sort of, again, balancing this like publication versus patenting, like you don't have a reagent in hand yet, but you really think you've got an interesting target. What would your advice be to someone in that situation? Yeah, uh, well, my advice would be is if possible, um, let's try to try to um, let's talk about the publication uh, timeline. And is there a way that we could get some screening done on that target? Um, there was a period of time where biological targets were something we did file patents on uh, somewhat routinely um, in the tech transfer office, but that changed a lot, um, I don't know, 15 years ago, plus or minus. Uh, and so biological targets um, aren't as, um, are, are, don't have as much value as, as, as a patent um, really today, and they're more difficult for us to do something with. So that's the first thing I would do is, is have a conversation with them around the publication timeline. Um, and uh, is my understanding is I'm curious to hear from our patent professionals. I mean, because the biological target gets disclosed, we won't necessarily lose all um, by the time we get around to finding um, potential new compositions of matter. So we can still pursue intellectual property protection when we get to the next phase of this. And that's the kind of conversation I would have with my research team. That's Awesome. Yeah, you, Todd, I think you're right. With the recent case law, you're not going to be patenting those those genes that you're targeting. Um, I know from my time working at Emory, we always try to find collaborators. Let's find a chemist for <laughs> that can make some of these mo molecules for you, and then we can do some some real patent work. You know, get some therapeutics out of this. But you're right; it it really is um, a balancing act with publishing and getting something on file um, with the patent office to protect that. Um, Maybe one strategy could be that you do have some potential compounds that you've already identified or functional groups that you can you may put onto a, a small molecule um, and then get something like a provisional application filed. Provisionals are not going to publish. They're not going to be examined. It could be a quick and quick way to get something protected, but it's not going to be an end all of what your invention might eventually be. But it could be some small form of protection while you're going to publish your target. Yeah, and, and one of the other things that happened to us, so um, no sooner did sort of biological targets go away as being a valuable intellectual property, um, but then we started pursuing broad genus claims. We said, okay, let's start screening those, those biological targets. Let's get five or 10 examples of, of uh, structure 
that will um, interact with them and then let's file a broad genus claim. But there have been uh, some interesting cases and Emory lost an arbitration itself over this uh, exact issue. Um, having a broad genus claim is no longer very valuable to an institution either. So, um, uh, so now we're trying to be more critical and hope that those five or 10 things uh, and hits that come out of the initial screening um, are as valuable as they possibly can be because we can't rely on a, on, on a, a broad genus claim that will cover a whole bunch of things and structures that might be related to it. It's probably going to be a much more narrow genus claim. And going that that's a great point, uh, Todd, having been involved in an arbitration proceeding uh, against at Emory uh, many years ago with respect to a broad claim. I could were tell you, you that- Were you uh, on the other side? Well, 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 well. Oh. Yeah. But, but nonetheless, I mean, you know, and, and what you're talking about, John and Todd and Sarah, there is a whole wealth of case law out there. You know, before you could you could think about a target and say, hey, you know, we've identified this target. And so this is what we want to do is we want to publish it, right? Because publish or perish. But you've automatically identified, you placed in the public domain some sort of target associated with some sort of condition. And, you know, so you would routinely file in the past the targets, but the case law related to what Sarah referred to earlier, the written description, section 112, has evolved so much that you really can't do that. And then we start switching over to function. Okay, hey, let's focus on this antibody that functions in this manner. And in fact, the, the US Patent Office advocated for that types of claiming. And then ultimately it went up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that unless you have reasonably enabled a number of examples. And so you really need to get with your researchers and think about the number of antibodies and even now, we're still looking at the contours in means plus function claims. You know, that's well established in patent law, but how can we then use those? And so we as patent professionals, Sarah and I, we're always thinking about ways to do more with less. And the less means, well, look, the, the you know, the handcuffs imposed by, you know, our legal courts are saying, look, we don't want you to be able to get this patent unless you disclose a heck of a lot more than what you've previously disclosed. So if you just disclose a target, eh, no. If you disclose <laughs> one example with a function, eh, maybe not. You know, so think about and discuss with your investigators and your researchers. Think very carefully before you publish anything related to the target, because gosh, that may cause you problems later on down the line. And I think that would be an easy discussion, Tom. But some people, you know, publish or perish, right? That's that's the tension that you have to deal with in academia. For sure. Sorry, Sorry I'm doing a Google search on your name right now, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I'm teasing, of course. Um, so I know we're we're a couple minutes over. Um, Mary, I saw you unmuted. Do you have anything else to add before we jump off? No, I mean, all the life science stuff, Todd's going to be dealing with that more than we are at Georgia Tech, obviously, although we do have, um, as you know, um, life science robust. Um, but yeah, everything he said, I agree. <laughs> as always. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Well, again, um, so I, we'll, we'll wrap this up. I really want to thank our presenters, Sarah and Dan, again. This was a fantastic presentation. Um, and I also want to thank Todd and Mary for, for joining for this discussion. Always great to talk to you about IP. Um, for the audience, um, please uh, check out our next Bench to Market talk in January. It'll be about investment and dilution. Um, and otherwise, thanks for attending today. It's a great talk.